Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? I, I, I think too, too many of us are shouting and not enough listening is taking place. We all think that we're right and the other person is wrong. And then we spend whatever interaction we have with them trying to prove that. Whereas actually there's a couple of fundamentals here that serve me well in, in all my negotiations when the stakes really couldn't get any higher. Hey there, before we get started, I want to share something really important with you. I started The View with one thing in mind, and that was to help you close the gap between what you want and where you are today to live the life you've always dreamed of. We've scoured the world to find the best guests to inspire you on that journey. Who better to learn how to be one of the few than those that already are? Individuals that do live life on their terms and have achieved their life dream. Subscribe to The Few with Boo now Join our community. If you find these episodes valuable, the more subscribers we have, the more listeners we get, the greater the guests we bring on the show. So subscribe now, hit the button, and let's dive into this episode of The Few. Our guest today is going to give us some really amazing insights into influence, uh, how to manage things that that are maybe outside of our, our control uh, and uh, our ability to influence those. Uh, and I reckon that if there was anyone on earth that would have a, a, the pedigree and the experience to be able to share stories on how to influence people in some of the most complex and uh, I would say potentially dangerous circumstances, it's our guest today. He's recently uh, written a book, uh, just been published. He's been on the airwaves all through the UK, all over the world, order out of chaos. He is hostage negotiator, super coach, uh, executive trainer, and all around uh, legend, Scott Walker. Scott, thank you so much for joining us uh, here on The Feud. It's awesome to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Scott, everything's a negotiation. Is that is that really a pretty simple philosophy to, to live in life? I personally think that's a great a great way to approach life and ne'er, ne'er a true word could be said. Uh, give us some insight in how you, how you view the world through that lens. Yeah, what a, what a great start. Yeah, life is a negotiation. And when you think about it, what, what is a negotiation? It's when we're communicating with another person, looking to not only influence and persuade, but ultimately bringing about some form of cooperation and crucially, collaboration. And if you think about it, all day long, we're, we're doing that. Whether it's with our kids, family, neighbors, colleagues, let alone across a board table in some business negotiation or even with kidnappers. It seems to me we're losing the art of the negotiation, though. If you have a look at uh, the state of politics, uh, we look at the extreme fringe and our abilities to not really come towards the centre anymore, but to start to to move away. What, what's going on? Like, wh why are we... What is it about you that understands implicitly that negotiation and, and exerting influence is so powerful and, and what's the rest of the world missing here including some of the most powerful human beings on earth well that's the million dollar question isn't it i i, I think <laughs> too too many of us are shouting and not enough listening is taking place we all think that we're right and the other person is wrong and then we spend whatever interaction we have with them trying to prove that whereas actually there's a couple of fundamentals here that serve me well in in all my negotiations when the stakes really couldn't get any higher the first one is around that emotional self-regulation you know if we if we're shouting if we're losing our cool our, our control then we're not really going to be able to influence and persuade the other person and actually then it's about well i need to demonstrate at least i'm making the effort to understand where the other person is coming from particularly if i don't agree with them and that's even more powerful if we can do that and allow the other person to feel hurt. Somewhere along the way, you went to school, uh, probably worked pretty hard at school. Maybe not. I don't know. But somewhere in there, something happened and you would have had your very first live negotiation with what was ostensibly a potentially bad person or a, or a person having a very bad day. What happened up until that point, uh, and just to fill in the gaps, everyone, uh, Scott spent over 16 years in Scotland Yard uh, <coughs> in, in this career stream before assisting the UN and traveling around the world dealing with many hostage uh, situations. But, but like anything in life, 
the difference between high stakes multi million dollar hostage negotiation and and day one. I have two questions for you. What led you to day one, and then what was day one like? Well, d- day one. Uh, you mean as a negotiator, how I got to... Yeah, your first, your very first real live negotiation. Yeah. Um, well, I've always been interested in what makes people tick, you know, this, this human psyche. So I've always been drawn to roles that involve that, particularly within the police. And then towards the last few years of my service, I, I got given an opportunity to get involved in kidnap for ransom negotiations. Um, and I remember the very first time I sat down there in in this negotiation in this really cramped apartment in London, and the family we were supporting they just weren't listening to our advice in terms of what we need to say, how we need to say, it, how we're going to get their loved one back had been taken by a drug gang. And I remember losing my own call with the family, and it took the reassuring tap on the shoulder or at least the, the the hand on the shoulder of my more experienced colleague to show me how it was done and it was a master class in how to manage your emotions because up until that point even though i've been interested in what makes people tick i hadn't really um mastered that art of first seeking to understand before being understood you can go on all the training courses in the world you can read all the books but it's only through that real experience of being there in the heat of the battle, so to speak, where you're practicing it and refining it. Uh, and that was a real wake-up call for me. That was like day one, really. Um, and then through to where I'm now, 10, 12, 15 years later, kind of have that lots of experience in my belt, made lots of mistakes, but thankfully a fan of what really does work now. So as a detective uh, in Scotland Yard, you, I think a lot of people uh, perceive that uh, being in policing... Uh, you typically come across uh, the worst of people or, or the worst of humanity. You're inevitably uh, dealing with crime. You're, you're dealing with people uh, who just aren't the best versions of themselves. Uh, what did you learn about people and, and humanity as a as a detective? And are you still able to have faith in, in human beings? Uh, or do you find that, you know, now that we're more aware of PTSD, now that we have a greater understanding of the impact of policing uh, on people, we, we don't put it in a box anymore. What were some of the, the things you felt or experienced throughout a fairly prolonged career there prior to getting into the K&R space? I have a huge belief, I mean, like, unshakable belief in that human beings are wired for, for good, that, um, that there's more good in the world than bad, and that actually we're all doing the best we can based on our skills, our experience, our knowledge, etc. And yes, I did see the worst of humanity, like real, and, it, and any serving or former cop will know this, will attest to this, that there are some, some horrific things that go on that the general public just don't really see. But there's still a faith in humanity there because I've also seen the good side of people. And I think that just the exposure to, I don't know, thousands of incidents really over the career is it it just gives you a window into what makes us tick which i go back to the point i made a few moments ago how it's just a fascinating journey that we're on and i actually get to a ringside seat now as to why we do what we do particularly when life doesn't go according to our plans you know when we're hit by the the overwhelm or the tsunami of adversity or however you want to describe it and so, yeah. How do you how do you how do you maintain your your own humanity? I mean, my, I have my personal experience with being in the military and then spending time in Afghanistan and being around uh, a lot of uh, very different uh, circumstances and environments than in the first world. That you gradually and insidiously just harden up more and more and more. And it's not till you start to see some of the impact on the softer parts of your life you realize, hang on a minute. Uh, you obviously now help people uh, and organisations and individuals build plans around mental health, uh, helping themselves when it comes to mental health. What were some of your own rituals or your your own journey with your own mental health being put in a position where millions, if not billions of human beings wouldn't go anywhere near experiencing the sort of things you experienced? Yeah, I think it comes down to the meaning you give things. Like you you and I could experience exactly the same set of circumstances or situation. One of us, it will be 
the the worst of days. That's it. It's it's game over. Whereas for the other one, it's oh, what a great opportunity. I can't wait to get stuck into this. And so I think in we're meaning making machines. And the meaning we give things dictates the emotions we feel and the quality of our life. And so over time, I've learned the hard way here, over time I've learned to reframe. I mean, the, the power lies in the reframe, right? Around how we can give things an empowering meaning, even if on the surface or externally, they look like huge obstacles and challenges and threats. Um, and that stood me in good stead because it's meant I can see things as they are, but not worse than what they are, not to catastrophize them. And then to take ownership. It doesn't matter what line of work you're in, is the first step in a lot of this is once you've had awareness of something, is to acknowledge it, accept it, and um, and take some responsibility to then do something about it rather than going into that downward spiral of doom and gloom. And I think that's a real challenge for people uh, in, in terms of if we don't uh, experience some level of discomfort or we don't allow ourselves to stretch our comfort zone and policing the military that's it's just a constant push of the uh, of the of the comfort zone however it's typically we're trained in it uh we're introduced to those steps slowly uh, and and over time we acclimatize to our environment uh, when these experiences come into the corporate world uh there can be a, a bit of pushback which is to say oh look you know we're not going to have a k and r situation we're not going to experience that sort of extreme circumstance like you scott well, why would what you experience be relevant to us here i mean we just sell toilet paper and toothpaste how do you see what you've experienced as having because i certainly do as having a profound effect on the mindset and the ways of working uh, of people who just live their, their normal lives? Yes, yeah, a great question. And you, you use the magic word there, mindset. And the, the mind doesn't know whether or not it's dealing with a tense negotiations with kidnappers in the jungle somewhere or really tense workplace uh, business deal or even a difficult conversation in a corporate environment. It, you know, it comes back to the point I made earlier about managing the emotions, first of all. It's about really understanding, okay, what are we dealing with here? looking or making the effort to look at this from the other person's perspective and they get okay well what's our plan of action here how are we going to communicate this how can i make sure that the person wants to continue doing business with me rather than just trying to hardball something through and people think that about negotiation or interrogation i spent time in iraq doing some interrogation work as well and people think it's all about hardball and shouting and the big ego and the alpha male and it's exactly to the end of the spectrum, the true success lies. And yes, you may get the, the odd win or the odd deal over the line by playing like that. But really, in this day and age, surely we want repeat business and referrals and people thinking, do you know what? Who's a great guy to do business with? We're going to continue doing that. Always great, you know, if there's a difficult conversation or challenging member of the team or a client, actually... Who's a great guy to have on site because he's unflapp unflappable. We can trust him, which is key. And you know, there's that likability factor, which we can often overlook. But you know, one thing I really emphasize here is never underestimate the, the power of the likability factor as well. <laughs> yeah, I remember we were zipping around a, a couple one night and it was pitch black after curfew. Acc we accidentally. Uh, stayed out a little bit late, and and as we're driving around, we came to a checkpoint and just beaming smiles and. My, my best friend and I who were over there with his business together, we said, I bet you no one ever got shot in the face while they were smiling. Uh, and that, that ability to just come across as like happy <laughs> and hey, yeah, we're just two guys in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, that, that disarming. I love what you talk about there in, in terms of likability. And so much of what we see on TV about business is, is being hardball, about being tricky. Uh, and I certainly found being in business, it's much easier to grow and be successful in business when everyone likes you and you like them and you trust each other. Uh, so with that in mind, based on the 300 odd uh, uh, negotiations you've had to date and what we see in business, what are some of the big mistakes people make when they're trying to negotiate uh, a beneficial outcome for themselves? They're making it all about them, first of all, uh, where actually it's nothing to do about you. Yes, you'll get what you need, but first of all, as, as I mentioned uh, before on this uh, podcast around, you've got to think about, okay, what is it the person looking for here? What are their needs and their wants? Okay, and... By doing that, A, it helps build rapport. 
And B, it then gives you the opportunity almost or affords you the right, you've earned the right to then actually articulate what it is that, that you want in here. And it's particularly when people want to talk about money, you know, they want the pay rise or they want to save money, they want to get a discount. I always say to people, don't discount non-monetary gains here either because it could be your boss might not actually be able to give you a pay rise. There may just not be the money to do that. But he could give you or she could give you an extra two, three days annual leave a year, for example. So it's having that flexibility around what it is you're really looking for here. The second step, or the second issue really, is we'll put these barriers up because we um, we may think we're superior to the person that we're negotiating with. And that can come across energetically at least, a bit dismissive, a bit judgmental, and that's not going to work. Sometimes we like to give advice rather than just listen. Um, there's a whole host of other things, both individually and corporately or organizationally that can get in the way, but they're like the main ones that, that really show up. Did you, uh, have a mentor, uh, when you embarked on this or was there a, a negotiator or someone that, that you observed and just thought that they were incredible in the way that they, they were with people and, and, and if, who was that and, and what was it about the way they went about, uh, their business that really appealed to you and, and created that insight? Yeah, I mentioned this in the book, is that I know it's a cliche, but I am genuinely standing on the shoulders of many giants. You know, I, I didn't create any of this stuff. I've just had the privilege of experiencing it over 10 plus years and and sharing it, my experiences. And so both in the police and uh, when I left the police into the corporate sector to do the, the K&R negotiations extensively, there are a handful of individuals who, the, the common themes amongst them were unflappable in a crisis, unbelievably unflappable. They just had that cool, calm, centered groundedness at the middle of the storm. They had unbelievable, unbelievable amounts of trust in themselves and in other people. Um, and they would be able to stay really focused on point and communicating what they needed. You know, you think, well, actually, Scott, that can apply to many areas of life. And that's the point. It was just that the stakes were higher. We couldn't afford to get it wrong, but the transferable skills were just plain to see, which is one of the reasons what actually prompted me to, to, to write the book in the first place is just the applicability of those fundamental core skills of those high performers, so to speak, in this tense world. Actually, you could use that in your family and, and in your business life as well. I think I think we should all get together and write a book and call it "When There's a Consequence," because any business or anyone that works in an environment where there's real cars and stereos and a and a significant consequence from poor performance, you just it's all the same habits. It's the same themes. It's being able to get from the animal brain up into the intelligent brain. It's the ability to focus on one thing and come back to that one thing, to keep calm, to just follow the process and stick to the process. Uh, now, do, if, do all your negotiations end positively? So it would. I have done so far. Um, although there's one which, the, one of the early ones actually, which did it. I mean, I wasn't directly involved in it, but it was a, a terrorist-related um kidnapping and actually we, we kind of suspected all along that the, the hostage was never going to come back it was more of a publicity thing for the for the for the terrorists um but in terms of all the criminal uh kidnaps and the extortions yeah success all, all, all the time and actually there is a no, there's a 93 percent success rate in a negotiation so if if you're in a part of the world and you get taken you know, you, you, I pray not to have a hostage rescue or to try and escape because there's a 93% chance you're going to come out alive in good time through a negotiation because this stuff works. And the remaining 7% is when people, they, they get die in a, in a hostage rescue attempt or they get injured and then die in the abduction or captivity or whilst trying to escape. Yeah, I remember when we... We're in London with Lloyds and getting all of our policies in place for working in the, the less fun parts of town. It was always that same scenario. Don't don't be a hero. Don't try and, and, and save the day. You're not the military. You don't have to try and escape every five minutes and just give you a serial number and your name. Uh, tip more often than not, you'll you'll get paid out and, and and come home. But what sort of does that 
and, and people, I guess, underestimate, you know, relatively speaking, how often this happens uh, in, in terms of uh, kidnap sort of scenarios. We see the odd piracy act or you know, the cartels in Mexico, uh, but but it's not when you're in the world, it's not actually that uh, rare to have organisations uh, have their employees um, kidnapped. Now, what are some of the tips, tips and techniques that you use with families or a key part of being a negotiator, it's all well and good that you're the unflappable one and that you're in control of the situation, but the ability to help other people understand what, what's going on, and it goes back to how we started, I guess, you're not just influencing uh, the kidnappers, you're, you're influencing all the stakeholders because I'm, I'm assuming the families are not in a great frame of mind during this situation. So how do you, what are some tips and techniques you use to deal with people who, 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 who are in their fight, flight or freeze response? They're not rational. Yeah, that's a really good point. We had a saying that if we lose the family, we lose the case. And what I mean by that is we had to get and keep the family on side with our negotiation strategy from the outset. Because we couldn't afford for them to go off by themselves, speaking to the media, speaking to the kidnappers separately, because it just confused matters and it actually put the hostages in greater danger. So it was, again, bringing about some core fundamental communication skills. It was about some active listening. You know, it was about empathizing. It was about trying to allow them to to bring their nervous system all balanced out as opposed to in that anxiety high anxiety states it was listening to them more than talking it was reassuring and validating what they're going through um and it was about encouraging them to focus on what we're doing hey we're a professional team we've done this before this is actually i know this is your loved one but this is actually a simple business transaction as far as the kidnappers are concerned they will want paying out. And as long as we do that, not for the amount they're asking for, because that will just encourage them to hold out for more, but to a suitable amount of money, uh, and then they'll be released. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it in the first place. So rest assured, there's a high success rate here. And in the meantime, we're going to keep you updated um, with the progress. And it's about reassuring them that we're going to do everything that we can. And this process works. Although there's no guarantees, it works uh, the vast majority of the time but but underpinning all of that it's building that trust because we can't influence people until we know what already influences them which is why the first maybe few hours the first day at least i would just spend with a family just getting to know them uh listening to them finding out what their concerns were about this uh and just building that empathy and the rapport and so then you've earned the right you've earned the trust to then seek a bit of cooperation from them does that make sense it does make sense <laughs> and it actually makes sense from a sales perspective because the, the way you're talking is very much uh, around what people uh, don't do in sales which is to walk in there and tell everyone how amazing their gear is and why they need to buy it and I'll give you a discount it's all great rather than ask that simple question which is hey how are you going how's what does good look like for you uh, what how's your organization going understanding implicit all oh, right, it doesn't sound like there's actually a chance to sell anything here, so I'm not going to sell anything. What's the point? R rather than get frustrated trying to force a situation uh, that uh, that doesn't that that doesn't exist, just exists in your mind. But Scott, you know, I've had the wonderful opportunity to speak to a lot a lot of people, and you demonstrate a very heightened uh, level of not just self awareness but situational awareness, which is not what people are born with. It's not how most people are throughout their whole lives. So for you, when did you start to see yourself outside yourself? When did you start to feel that awareness come to you and that there's more than just Scott, there's a, you are part of a, of a cog in a bigger machine and the way the world works together, whilst it's complicated, there are certain patterns that if we stick to kind of work. Uh, yeah, my understanding of your question is, is when did I notice actually that there's a bigger picture here or there's is there's more to it than just in the daily grind? Yeah, you sort of, you went from the day to day. Yeah, correct. That's right. Yeah. Well, I've always been a, a, a curious bugger, really. I, I mean, growing up, I was always asking why and much to the annoyance of parents and grandparents and people. So I was um, always interested in, in what was going on out there, really. Um, but I guess... I think it was a gradual process, you know. There wasn't a one day I woke up thinking, all oh, right, I've got it now. 
or I've got it all figured out, or I've suddenly entered a portal with a new <laughs> view on the world. I think the cumulative process of 16 years as a, as a detective and then seven years or so uh, outside of that in the, in the corporate world, probably 10 years down the corporate world, um, it's just gradually, after, you know, case by case, experience by experience. And I've always been one who's been curious to experience things at the edge of my comfort zone. Not an adrenaline seeker at all, far from it. You know, going on, on roller coaster rides is not my thing or parachute jumps. I just don't do that stuff. But I am curious as to, okay, how can I expand my threshold of control? So that could be signing up to go to Iraq. Or it could be something because actually, do you know what? I'm going to go live in a different part of the country or I'm going to um, take a different course, you know, learn a musical instrument or I'm actually going to um, go traveling to a different part of the world, for example. You know, so it doesn't matter what it is. It's just constantly exposing yourself to new ways of thinking, and feeling and, and behaving. And I think accumulatively over, over the years, that's just built up to the extent now where I'll go anywhere and do anything at any time. There's no, there's nothing that will phase me that could really show up. So how do you find peace in all of that? I mean, that's a busy life. That's keeping yourself well nourished. Uh, but what's how important is rest and, and recovery in your in your rituals? Yeah, crucial. Um, and again, I've had to work hard at that because you know, people like yourself and and other people who who are doing well, so to speak, in life. You know, slowing down and taking a day off or just resting can be anathemic. Anathemic because when I go, I could be doing this, 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 and this, and this uh, instead. And it always, it always got um, described to me as hammock time, you know, lying in a hammock. And, you know, how many times a day do any of us go, do you know what? I want to take maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes to have, for some hammock time where you've got no screens. Nothing. You're just chilling out on the couch or in the hammock, just resting, allowing the world to pass you by. And so I had to force myself to incorporate a few of those blocks throughout the day just to, again, balance it all out. Because you're right, it's 100 miles an hour otherwise. But even if I can't, uh, or even if I don't do that every day, I've learned to build in transition time. What I mean by that is bringing in the power of the pause. So after this podcast, for example, before rushing on to the million and other one things I've got to do today, I'll just take a few seconds or a minute just to kind of go, just to settle myself and go, right, okay, that was good, good, great experience, great conversation. And then I can transition with intention into my next thing to do. So I'm not just constantly bouncing around from one thing to the next. And again, they're like mini, mini superchargers, really. Even if it only lasts for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, but if I do that throughout the day, it means I can get to the evening and not be completely exhausted. And that's something I've just learned and developed over, over time, really. I think the really telling point there is is the purposefulness that you bring to that rest. You, you don't just accept that there, there is rest uh, that happens by, by accident because uh, there's that whole... Um, you know, resting mentality where if you're a busy person, you might think you're resting, but your brain's still going all over the place. So it's that really super purposeful, proactive, take a deep breath, move from one phase to the next phase. Uh, Dr. Adam Fraser is a doctor in Australia, talks about the third space, about when from, from work to home or transitioning from one state of mind to another to invest in the third space and reset yourself before you go on to the next one because otherwise you just drag all the different spaces into each other and you just end up with just just a mess of everything everywhere all the time very hard to to kind of be present in the moment um, in each one of those uh, transitions again in a negotiation for example if i was off thinking about i don't know where i want to go on holiday or what i'm going to have for dinner in the middle of the negotiation that's not going to turn out too well and so bringing presence, your complete self to the moment, whatever it is you're doing, is key to, to any kind of successful negotiation or communication as a whole. And I think it, in the world at the moment and, and the distractions that we see through all these digital devices, I guess if you're tuned into it, do you notice that people are less present? Do you notice when you're sitting with someone at a cafe or you're having one-on-one -on -one time that a lot of people are there in, in person only, not in spirit and in mind? Yeah, absolutely. You can just tell we've, we've developed over the last year couple of years maybe where our attention span is just shrinking at some extortionate rate 
um, you know, trying to get my kids to sit down and read a book. Do you know what? I might need to call it some external help now. I mean, I mean, that's a negotiation. I'm not winning. Um, <laughs> but but, but it, you're right. It, that's it, the 7% that don't quite make it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but we absolutely, uh, we, we, we're, we're losing that, that sense of just being present. Mm -hmm. So go back to when you're on the job, right? Is there a time when you felt it slipping away where you, where you, where you felt in terms of a deliverable, which is getting someone home, uh, was almost I impossible. Did you, have you ever had a negotiation that's gone that far? Have they all been pretty, you know, in the big scheme of things, banal? The majority of K and R cases actually follow a pretty steady pattern. Does the other side kind of know what's going on? Are you, are you dealing with people that do this all the time and they kind of just, they've just got a bit of a system and they know how it works? Yeah. I, and I want to negotiate with people like that. I want to negotiate with professional kidnappers. Now leave the morals and the ethics behind it, that we're reinforcing what they're doing. Because if your loved one is taken, you won't be having that mindset. You'd be like, Scott, get them back at all costs. Um, and I want to be working with a professional group of kidnappers because they know that this is a business transaction. It's the erratic, highly emotional, dangerous kidnappers, the amateurs that I that I worry about. There's been a few though that have taken a little turn, got off script, so to speak, um, where you're thinking, I've no idea how this is going to pan out. I really don't. And things don't go according to plan. And the, it could be, the, we call it the crisis within the crisis, where dealing with the kidnappers is easy, but dealing with our own side, dealing with the family or the, or the client, the company, that can be the challenging part as well, where egos and internal politics and posturing and, you know, all, all this irrational behavior just comes to the forefront, which then manifests itself in the conversation with the kidnappers. You know, on one case, they, the, the communicator we were using because of a language barrier started threatening the kidnappers. I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know, we, we try and end the call quickly, but the kidnappers got there before us and said, okay, we're, we're going to kill him. And they hung up and we didn't hear anything for six months. Now, you can imagine. That's, that's hardcore negotiation right there. You, you, you can imagine the emotional roller case of the family and the company. And myself was going on there thinking, right, what's just happened? But lo and behold, we managed to swap the communicators around. And after six months, the uh, kidnappers got back in touch and we resumed the negotiations and thankfully... That uh, that what worked out in the end. Well, on that uh, on that note, uh, mate. In terms of your life journey, getting to where you are today, published author, uh, very successful career, uh, living life on your own terms. Is there anything you would have gone back and told Scott at school, uh, either to make the journey a little bit quicker, a little bit more painless? Uh, what would you say to yourself? We're social creatures, so surround yourself with good people. You don't have to be. Uh, doing all of this by yourself. The, the people who, who if you get them on your team and you can work well with, actually you can go further. It's that, it's that cliche, isn't it? If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. And um, yeah, surround yourself with, with good people and uh, it, it makes the journey a lot easier as well. And not only easier, but more enjoyable as well. That's great, uh, great advice. We just had a, a, a last podcast guest, very, very similar. The people around you uh, really are the people that make your journey, that, where all the insight and all the surprises come from uh, when you've got that, that cheer squad. Scott, thanks so much for coming on the show. Scott Walker, author of Order Out of Chaos, scottwalker.com. Please reach out uh, to him. Uh, if, uh, well, if you're looking to get the things you want out of life to accelerate that A to B. Uh, listening to the podcast now and just reflecting on it, it seems that when it comes to a negotiation, it's the party that wants something seems to be the more difficult party to deal with rather than the party that's that's giving. And given that we all want a great life or we all want a house and want money, want, what, what, I think there's a lot we can learn from you, Scott, in terms of how we temper our behaviour and, and get those things in a way that's good for everyone. So thanks so much, Scott, for joining me on the future. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And just to clarify, the, the, the email address is scottwalkerbooks.co.uk um, if people want to check that out as well. But it's been great to be here chatting with you. Thank you. We will fix that up for you, mate. Uh, thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. I'll let you get into your transition space now before you <laughs> embark upon, no doubt, the 20 other things you need to do today. Thanks again. Thank you.